progress and the campaign goes back and forth. It's it's delightful. So but now things are heating up a little bit. Yeah. I think Greg's doing There he goes. Now he's starting to bring those leader powers. So you can imagine in a three-player game, legendary difficulty, much more challenging, but pretty interesting. The three of us could pick different leaders and yeah. kind of synergize and use our leader powers in cool ways to really uh, give us the advantage. Yeah, he's really he's really digging in there. Bonus course drop. How close? So the wave is kind of coming to an end here. We can see the enemies coming in. Yeah, you see it in the upper right there. Uh, yeah. He's right now in wave four. This demo will go to, well, there's five waves. And he's infected 47 out of 111. So right now, we just got that notification. Wave five's about to start, which features yep. the abomination. Max, uh, what's the story of that guy, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the cool things about the waves, too, is we're going to have these basically these boss waves, these mini boss waves, uh, where you get some really big heavy units coming in to attack you. And in this particular wave, we've got a flood commander that's going to come in, and he's a really strong melee uh, threat and uh, surrounded by a bunch of his minions there. And so uh, he's going to come in, and you'll see that's going to put a lot more strain on uh, Greg's defenses and his forces, so he's got to really make sure his base and his powers are ready to go. He's got to dig in. Uh, yeah, he's getting ready for it. Should be, they should be coming in any minute here. Any minute now. We're waiting for the big reveal. Don't fail me now, Greg. <laughs> And, if you're just uh, tuning in, you're watching a little bit of Halo Wars. This is the brand new downloadable yeah, content go. that's coming later this year, right, Brian? Yep, it'll be yep. out in the fall, Larry. It's a uh, full campaign expansion. When this is our new multiplayer mode called Terminus Firefight. Oh, here comes the flood. There's the flood. Oh, the there, oh the big my commander. God. Yep. Now we're going to find out what Greg's made of. I'm having flashbacks to 10 plus years ago. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's been almost 10 years since right. we've seen uh, the flood. Look yeah. at that boss in the middle. That's the abomination. Take him down. Take him down, Greg. So one of the things he tries to do is pull these units across these different defenses that yeah. he has. He's trying to lead them on a little bit. That's yep. right, yeah. God, those, those, the way those flood swarm is unbelievable. Yeah, you know, they're they're not that powerful in, in their own right, but once enough of them get on top of you, uh, it, they'll... In, tr in typical flood fashion. Absolutely. All right, because he's going after the boss now. Yep. He's going to try and get around, and the bosses are always going to go after your nexus. That's the home the home part of your base you really got to defend, so that's where he's he's moving towards. Yep, it's, it's coming down here to the final. Greg's already got 224,000. That's actually, that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the cool things, too, about this mode is there's a lot of different factors that play into how you score in the mode. So right. you can choose your difficulty. That's kind of a multiplier. You've also got bases, and as you expand out, that increases your multiplier. If you lose them, it goes back down. How quickly you defeat the waves and, you know, how many enemies you can destroy at any given time, all that factors into how you score. I don't think this guy's even going to get near his spire. He's still just kiting, yeah, he's, he's kiting him around like he's yeah, doing a good job here. I, I feel like he's making this look easy. I mean, that is the caveat. We did make this extra, a little extra easy demo for the show here, but at home it's going to be uh, certainly more challenging. Congratulations, Greg. And I think I think that's about it. Greg's yeah, going to be... do it. Apparently he's playing easy go. mode. Nice. <laughs> nice work, nice Greg. Nice work, Greg. Yeah. All right. Earlier this week, Kiki Wolfkill brought us a Halo Plasma rifle with a, that a bunch of you guys over 343 yep. signed. And today, we're going to give it away to a fan in the audience. Brian, Brian you've been there. involved with the there Halo community oh, wow. for a long time. Why wow. don't you pick a lucky audience member? Wow. Let me see this the pressure. Wow. Look at this thing. Um, let me see. It's really hard pressure. <laughs> I'm going to go. Thing. I'm gonna go for the guy in the ODS T-shirt. There you go. I'll let you. I will come, come on, on up here. Down. Bring him up here. I don't know how TSA will respond to uh, this, yeah, but you're, uh, you're on your own there, buddy. Nice to see you, man. Take there you this go. Thing. This is yours. You. All right. We'll let you. Hold on. Don't move. Oh God, boy. All right. Thank you to Max, Brian, Greg, and uh, what's your name? Dustin. <laughs> the Awakening of the Nightmare launches this fall, and now it's time to get the latest and the greatest from the Fulbright Company. Here's a look at Tacoma, their much anticipated follow-up to Gone Home.
favorite Xbox moment of all time actually has nothing to do with games. I live in Finland and my sister was getting married in Australia. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there for the wedding. However, thanks to the magic that is Xbox Live and Skype, I was able to actually sit on the sofa here, all dressed up nice, and attend the wedding virtually. They had a, a TV and an Xbox set up at the wedding and, and people were just coming by talking to this television screen with, with, my, with my face in it. And if it wasn't for Xbox and for Skype, then, then I would not have been able to attend my sister's wedding. And I will, I will always be, be grateful for that. So Skype team, Xbox Live team, thanks guys, you're, you're awesome. Scorpio! All right, Graham, be cool, be cool. Don't mess this up. Oh my goodness, I'm here with the Lord of the Xbox. Lord. It's Phil's, I knew you don't would like call me Lord that. of don't the call Xbox. Me that. King of the don't Xbox. Don't call me that. No. Don't Remember call. the time I called you head honcho and you didn't like that either? I don't either. like that either. All right, everyone, Part it's of the Phil team. Spencer. Phil Spencer, everybody, uh, come on. Uh, Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pretty cool stage, right? Right in the heart I like of the action. I like it. I like it in the middle. We've, uh, we did this once at the Brazil Game Show where we're right in the middle of the uh, the audience and it was fantastic. All the energy the fans bring is just such a core absolutely. part of our show. You know that. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to have them all around. So let's start with your favorite moment of the show, obviously apart from right now. Well, this is it. Uh, my favorite moment, honestly, at the press briefing when I got to walk out on stage for the first time, all the fans were there. Uh, it's such uh, just an a moment, a, a emotional moment for me when you're there. You feel all the passion from the people. They're excited. I'm excited. I'm trying not to mess up. But they bring such an energy to our press briefing, and you just see everybody who's going to come out on stage light up. I think it's fantastic. What is that moment like just before you step out? Like, do you do any centering or like, what is it like for you? That's a huge moment. Uh, I'm pretty nervous before I go out. You know, I think about the thousands of people on uh, the team that do way more work than I do to make all of this possible. I want to represent them the right way. I want the. I want them to be proud of being on Team Xbox, uh, and I feel that. Like when I come out, I feel like I, I get the privilege to represent an amazing team that does amazing work, and uh, I want to kind of, it, it gets emotional more for me because I, I, I think about all them, all the faces, some of them here, many of them as you know, not, not here, sure. uh, but this is such a great time for the industry, great time for our team, and great time for gamers. Now I know you're really passionate about independent development in particular, and I thought it was great that we had so much time in our briefing for Idea Xbox. Yeah. Why is that important to you, and are there a couple of titles that you've particularly got your eye on? Yeah, you know, the, the Idea and Xbox program we announced on stage, we've, we've had over 500 games published on Windows 10 and Xbox One, I think some of the best games on our platform have come through the ID program over the years. When we started this generation, uh, I'll be the first to admit, we weren't really sure how the independent developer was gonna play a role on console, had been more of a PC thing, uh, but it's Chris Charla, the team at ID at Xbox is an amazing work. Uh, the Darwin Project was something I really thought. I love having the Shoutcaster yeah, on stage. Yeah, it was cool, wasn't it? Yeah. He was amazing. Like, he did that. I saw him do that like four or five times, and it was different every time, and he brought the batch in every time. It was it was so good. Um, and their interaction with Mixer that they kind of showed in that briefing, I think really foreshadows what we're going to see in game development as people start writing games that take advantage of not only the player, but also give the viewer an opportunity to interact with Twitch and Mixer and all these things coming. Uh, I think it's just a whole new audience opportunity for us. That was a pretty special game for us. Uh, but I mean, the, the lineup of games in, in the, the briefing from the ID program I thought was incredible. I was impressed that that Darwin Project Shoutcaster managed to keep his voice going. Because he, he was jamming on it, I don't it, think he, he talked at any of Like, I'd see right. him on stage and he would do, he was a mime until he came out on stage. Brilliant. He did about like Artful Escape, another like just such an amazing stylized game. Yeah. You know, it's just been uh, such a fountain of, of fun. Like, it's kind of a cliche term, but. I mean, I played so many of those games recently, and I continue to to just be really impressed by the creativity from the developers on the ID at Xbox program. Great, and of course, everyone was waiting to see Xbox One X. That's right. And it was great to reveal it. How did that feel for you to reveal it publicly on stage? Well, you know, kind of my second most favorite thing in the briefing was having Kareem Chowdhury come out on stage. Yeah. And those of us that have worked on the team for such a long time know Kareem's been a longtime engineering leader on the Xbox team. 
and uh, he was very, very nervous to come out on stage. But I thought, no better person. He's head of all engineering for Xbox, all our developers, software developers, work for Kareem. Uh, he finished the video last year, if you remember, it's the monster. Yeah. He got to kind of come out How and tie the bow on that. Uh, but it, it was great to see him come out, finally get to, uh, I'll still probably slip up and call it Scorpio a thousand times, but give it a name, <laughs> Xbox One X, uh, show the people what it looked like, how our hardware team has made it so small, uh, and obviously the, the power specs that we're getting out of it uh, are pretty incredible, even beyond what our expectation were. So much for like right before Mike Ibarra had, had sent out that we were giving game developers an extra gigabytes of RAM, so they're yeah. now to nine gigabytes of uh, RAM for game developers. It's just going to be a fantastic time to see that come and see what games are built. So how can developers use that extra power in the games that they're making now? Yeah, you know, for us it's always been about putting the tools in the hands of the developers and letting them make the creative and technical decisions they want uh, to deliver the right games. I've had certain people tell me, hey, you should mandate 60 frames per second, you should mandate a certain resolution, frame uh, resolution for the game. I'm not going to do that. Now our, our box natively supports a native 4K frame buffer. It supports 60 frames per second. It supports checkerboarding. Uh, but if somebody want, and, and I'm going to put those tools in the hands of the developers and say, you make the, the decisions you want. We opened the show with Forza Motorsport 7. You, oh, there it is. I yeah. Didn't even, uh, and you see a game that's running at uh, 60 frames per second with a native 4K. But other developers are going to make different decisions, and I think that's, as a platform holder, we have to give the developers the best tools we can, the best hardware we can, and let them take that experience where they want it to. And don't get into this, we're going to mandate this number or that number, uh, and that's how I, I think we'll end up with the best games. Yeah. What's been your read on the fan reaction to Xbox One X? It's been fantastic, the ones I've talked to. Now maybe it's, I get a little bit of self-selection, but, <laughs> uh, but it's been great to see, I think, Xbox has always been about power in my mind from working on the original Xbox and now we, we get this, uh, we get the world's most powerful console as part of our Xbox line of consoles. I see a lot of uh, pride from the long-term Xbox fans, uh, but also, you know, the S console has done so well for us this year when we launched it in kind of uh, early fall last year supports HDR, 4K Blu-ray, upscales to 4K. Yeah. Uh, it's really these two products in our hardware lineup, I can see kind of a reinvigoration of uh, the Xbox community, which is nice. We also got to show 42 games on our stage, 22 with console exclusivity. I hear over and over, you know, I want to see games, I want to see games. We went a little long in the briefing, we showed a lot of games, uh, but I thought the lineup was fantastic. Absolutely, and the name Xbox One X as well, our best kept secret. What's the story behind the name? Uh, it was true what I said on stage, you know, the early Xbox team, uh, there's no big greater power than the power of X. Yeah, I love that Was quote. something that really drove us, and we were thinking about names. Kind of people know this about me. I'm a little nostalgic in the games industry. I like back and pad. I brought OG back and pad. I thought it was fun. So, you know, that original team that uh, we were able to drive inside of Microsoft, this investment in a game console, and we should get into uh, this business. I wanted to pay homage back to that team and some of their mottos. And so Xbox One X kind of works. As you've been having to say it over and over as I, you know, you have Xbox One X, X, Y, you get the enunciation down. But yeah. as a name, I think it means something to us uh, at, at a kind of a, a team level, and, and that's important. I think it's cool that a lot of the fans are still going to refer to it as Scorpio no as problem. well. No problem. That's cool, right? I have no problem with that at all. I mean, it's uh, we should be proud of, of the not only the building of things, but how we end up with finished product. I think three years from now when somebody's buying their first console and there's an Xbox One X console and if they don't understand Scorpio and all, that's all good. Like that's where it will go. But for those of us that were around during the announce on stage last year, through the development, through this special event, and then through the launch on November 7th, I think having Scorpio in our hearts, that's all good. That's what games are about. Right. Now I've been banging on about Forza Motorsport sort of 7 all week. I, just, yeah, I love that game. whole franchise. It's over there. It's fantastic. Yeah. And I know you're a big fan as well, right? I love Forza. So what is it, what is it about Forza Motorsport 7 that's got you excited? Well, I'm going to back up a second just to go a little bit long on this. Um, I cannot stop playing Hot Wheels. Yes. On Forza Horizon it's so 3. Good. It's so yeah. ridiculously good. Like it's I think I've maxed out all I think there's one more achievement I have to get on Hot Wheels. Yeah. But hats off to the playground team cuz uh, Forza Motors, for, all right, Forza Horizon 3 was fantastic. Uh, we obviously did Blizzard Mountain expansion pack which I thought was great. 
Hot Wheels, like that's kind of a new thing for us. We're a little more realistic than Hot Wheels, yeah. and all of a sudden you drop Hot Wheels, and I just literally can't stop playing. I've been that playing game. on Copilot with my three-year-old oh, son. How is he's that? Just, he's loving it. Yeah, yeah. And it's been great for me because it's the first time I've actually properly used Copilot in that kind of environment. What does he do? Does he, he do gas so or he does he the steer? throttle? Yeah, and it's that's all perfect. throttle all the time. That's how I brought him up. <laughs> Come on, Dad. And I do the Keep steering. It yeah, it's, and it's fantastic. And he it just that. resonates so well with I him. I love that story. That's so good. Yeah, Forza Motorsport Seven. I think Turn Ten. Uh, it, it's hard to argue that they're not the best racing studio on the planet right now. Yeah. I mean, they've just time in and time out, high quality game, great visuals. Uh, the relationship with Porsche, being able to unveil the GT2 RS, while it's cool to be able to do that on stage, and the partnership with Porsche is so uh, is is going to be important to this game. It's also a testament to how car manufacturers view Turn 10 and how they uh, take it take care of their brands, right? The fact that Porsche would come out and do the world premiere of that game with us. And then from here, I go to Le Mans, 24 hour Le Mans, because we have the eSport championship. Yeah. I'm gonna be there and the winner of our Forza eSport championships is gonna be on the podium at Le Mans. It's all part of that strong partnership. And it's, you know, that to me, like I said, it's a real testament to how car manufacturers view both the game industry, that's for all of us, whether it's Gran Turismo, whether it's Need for Speed, you know, the, the games industry and the racing category is an important uh, part of how auto manufacturers see reaching their customers, reaching their fans, uh, and to get the partnership and see such a high quality game coming next year, I think it's just fantastic. Great stuff. Have you had a chance to this, walk this the show year. floor? Is there anything no, that uh, I stands out I was, Well, I was in uh, yesterday, I did a game spot thing right. on, and yeah. uh, so I was walking before it was open, uh, so I walked, I was in the other hall, and I, I walked through Nintendo's booth a little bit, walked through Sony's booth a little bit. This is the first time, actually, I've been able to get in the South Hall. They kind of locked me up in a 10 by 10 room. And, right. You know, I, I answer questions all day. I feel like I'm being inter uh, interrogated. But <laughs> this, is, uh, this is my first time, and it's such a great, I mean, look at these people. You guys are fantastic. It is awesome. Great stuff. Take us behind the scenes a little bit on, on E3 for you and Xbox, and not just at the show, but all the months and years of planning that goes into it in advance. Just how much work is that, and how, and how big of a team is involved? Yeah, I mean this, not everybody sees this, that we start this, I mean honestly, this process has already started for next year. One of the meetings I had today, total truth, was about next year's E3. Nice. And it's just kind of crazy to yeah. think about but we're already on that. But from a real kind of production planning, uh, it starts really kind of November, December. We start looking at the games that we're gonna want to show, the themes that we're gonna want to talk about, start looking at the different assets that the teams are putting together, both first party and third party, to put the show together. And you know, to all these people, you can't see them. I, I see them, like this is one time I see them every year, they're not even looking up at me, but I'll still <laughs> wave it up. Uh, it's so much work. You know, sitting out here, you know, I we tried to get Tina to come out uh, and do yeah, the interview with us to kind of bring me. back uh, somebody. Uh, thanks for saying no, Tina. Yeah. But the, uh, but you know, there's so many people that just put their sweat, blood, sweat, and tears into making this show what it is. Yeah. I just want to say to all the people out here, this is such a, a year-long endeavor for the teams, and I'm, I'm so proud to get to work with them. Uh, and the show's come off so well. I think this is probably the best show we've ever had. Uh, as Xbox and uh, thanks to the fans obviously uh, but also the team behind well, that's it. that's the other side of that right you know I, I, one of the things I absolutely love about events like this and Gamescom which is coming up soon is that all of a sudden we're here with the fans and I know that means so much to you. Do you, do you have a message you'd like to, to tell the Xbox fans both here and watching online? Yeah I, I feel like I get repetitive on this but it is so tr true to me I mean people know I'm, I'm P3 on Xbox Live I get online and I play with people I hear their positives, I hear their negatives, um, and I know that it comes from a place of wanting to make this industry a better place. You know, I really view uh, developing games as an art form. It's something I'm proud to have been a part of for so many years. I want to see it continue to grow. And the passion for the, of the fans, sometimes standing in line, maybe sometimes standing in line more times than we would like, uh, coming out, seeing you know bozos like me talk about video games and stuff, but it, it is just such an important part of what drives us as we're making our decisions about the policies that we're gonna, we're gonna have on our platform, by the games that we actually go green light, by the hardware that we go build. It is all for the fans and not at just some kind of PR level. Literally, we're in a, we're in a category that only works if we capture the hearts of people 
uh, with the work that we do. And the, the fans are just such a fantastic part of Team Xbox. And uh, I thank them for all the, the commitment they have to us. It's been a fantastic ride. Nice. There you go, everyone. Round of applause for the fans in here. What about that? Fantastic. What's next for you today then, Phil? Are you back into the 10 by 10 room? Or? Yeah, no. Uh, I'm actually going on Giant Bomb tonight. Oh, That'll nice. That'll be good. Well, that's fun, yeah. Yeah, Giant Bomb's always good. Uh, tomorrow, I'm actually doing... Um, I'll be up there, and we're doing something back to Redmond for Microsoft, so we'll be showing some people. And yes, the rest of the time, I'll be locked in a little room answering questions. All right, well, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming out of the little room no, to spend fantastic. some time with us. It's been brilliant. Everyone give up for Phil Spencer. Yeah. There you go. And now, here's a look at the next of your fan favorite E3 trailers. Hi, I'm John Warner, game director for Anthem. you do? I made a mistake. I hired some people. They weren't freelancers. I know. They said they could handle it. And the price was right. I thought maybe. Unbelievable. You're right. It was stupid. I'm sorry. But they're still out there. Somewhere. If you could just bring them back. Anything you need. In the world of Anthem, you and your friends are freelancers, the heroes who leave the safety of the walls of Fort Tarsus to explore the unknown and protect humanity. Let's join two players as they head out on an expedition. Hey, Paul. You ready to go? We're just grabbing some supplies. Just about ready. What are you going to use today? I decided to go with the Colossus. I'm going to use my Ranger. Try out some new upgrades. Every player will own an array of exosuits we call javelins. These suits give players superhuman capabilities and are heavily customizable so they look and play how you want. Bam, looking good. Nice, you've got a mortar equipped. Yeah, I got it on the weekend. You lead the way, I'll follow. This is a vast open world you explore with your friends. Each Javelin exosuit has its own unique playstyle. The Ranger is balanced and all purpose, while the Colossus is a tanking powerhouse. All right, let's see what's up here. The world of Anthem is hostile, and threats can come from any direction. It's a dynamic world where the unexpected is around every corner. Sure, we're running solar supplies on this guy. Yeah, he seems like a problem for another day. We're getting some fire from up ahead. I'll go low. You flank. later with Kim. <laughs> yeah, you could use the XP. Hello, treasure. I think we 
got some action on that. Anyone? Anyone? We're under attack. Anyone in the area? We're under attack. I think that's part of Praxis' mission. You can equip your Javelin exosuit with gear that brings devastating power to combat. Oh, there are a lot of scars down there. Oh, the scars have a heavy. Yeah, time to use that mortar. There's a bunch more coming in. Okay, I'll get this round. <laughs> oh, come on. Be something good. Oh, yes! Jer's Wrath. Oh, nice. Large scale world events like Shaper Storms are dynamic and pull you off the beaten path with the promise of new stories to discover. Oh, Shaper Storm incoming. Okay, actually let's get some more people. Hold on a sec. Hey guys, what's up? Hey, what's happening? Right behind you. supposed to do? Fly into it? All right, let's do this. See you on the other side. Our story is out there. Creepy cyberpunk horror game Observer comes to us from the makers of the skin crawling layers of fear and it's already giving me nightmares. Thankfully, Jonathan Miller is here to talk me through them. Hey, Jonathan, how are you doing? Thank you. Excellent. Great to be here. Yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? Are you enjoying being in the throng? Oh, right in the heart of it. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the game that the Bloober, sorry, Bloober team and Absolutely. Aspire have put together. Uh, Bloober team based out of Krakow, the creators of Layers of Fear. This is their second game. Yeah. It's a cyberpunk horror game. Takes place in the year 2084. Okay, and you, I'm sold just on the combined light together. Yeah. 2084. Yeah. Uh, you play as an observer, which is a neural detective who has okay. the authority to hack and invade suspects' minds Loving in it. order to gather evidence and solve crimes. They're a detective, but they just shoot a little needle in your head, access your neural implant, and then they're swimming in your fears, your hopes, your nightmares, so trying to old, find clues. Not, not old style detective work then, no. This is new style, this is cyberpunk detective work. Now these guys mm, are like, okay. the people okay. of Krakow, Poland, where this game takes place, they are deathly afraid of observers. Observers are yeah. considered like the biggest abuse of police power. They don't just invade your home, they invade your head. Yeah. Uh, you play as Dan Lazarski. Yeah. Uh, his son is a high-level engineer for Chiron Corporation, which is the big dystopian evil cyberpunk corporation you have to have. You have to have an evil dystopian corporation in a game. It's... What's cyberpunk without it? Exactly. And uh, he's gone missing, so Chiron's looking for him, and Dan kind of tracks his location to this building, but as he arrives, he stumbles upon a murder, and as he is a detective, yes. uh, he's going to take it upon himself to solve this, this crime. And... Uh, hopefully get one step closer to finding his son who's there somewhere who's there somewhere so when they kind of go into your mind yeah. do they mess with it as well or do they are they just kind of just you know uh read only let's put put it this way they are not happy that you are there and when you're in someone's mind it's it becomes like a maze of the psyche you're going to experience this really trippy 
It's like a. It's like playing through an interactive nightmare. You're like hallucinating the <laughs> Wait, entire I'm, time. Wait, okay, I'm rescinding my interest. If you're expecting my zombies and rocket launchers and survival horror, you're okay. going to be disappointed. Okay. But if you want to like go into someone's head, this guy, for instance, uh, in the gameplay today, he's an ex-con. He's a drug addict. So no, as you go through his mm -hmm. memories, you're going to see like the signs of a hard life in prison manifest themselves in the level design. You're going to see he's going to grab this spoon that turns into a chain, and it's like the chain of drug addiction is wrapped around him. So it's a lot of symbolism, a lot of meaning. Blooper wants every journey excuse me, into these heads yeah. to be a very personal, individual, and really terrifying experience. Did you ever watch the Jennifer Lopez movie, The Cell? Is oh, it yeah. a bit like that, Oh, I mean, but it doesn't, without Jennifer Lopez? It doesn't have that beautiful dress uh, or Vincent D'Onofrio. Cool. I remember yeah. that dress. Yeah. yeah. OK, all right. But Keep it clean. It, it's, it's deep, and it's very Eastern European. These guys uh, grew up in Krakow. They were always inspired by things like Blade Runner and Ghost in the Shell, very yeah. American and Japanese cyberpunk. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to make what is Eastern European cyberpunk. It's dark. It's, it's gritty. Fun. It's uh, low life, high tech is how we like to put it. So when they... When you're going through the mines, is this is this what's happening now? That we're going Absolutely. through like these kind of nightmares. So, what do we look like? How do you how do you solve a crime by going through somebody's nightmare? Like, what are you looking for? Uh, each person's mind tells a story. Yeah. You are right now. We've already kind of been through this sort of prison sequence. Yeah. Now this is a moment where he's actually meeting his wife, and it's a really big question. Uh, as you're in someone's head, you open up your entire history and all your personal details are out there for this detective yes. to sift through. But it's like these memories bleed and cut into each other very quickly. That's why it's so hallucinogenic. You're, I mean, you're definitely in the dream world as you play this. So you're gonna... You know, are, you, we, are you gonna know the clue when you see it? I, I think there's a lot up to interpretation, but Everything is going to lead you on a journey to a very horrible, terrible truth at the end. Well, that's not really selling it for me. It sounds awful. But I mean, so who, who's actually going to be the antagonist of the game? Like, who? who? Boy, I would answer that in a few ways. I would say first is Chiron. You have this evil corporation. Now, they right, actually okay. fund the Observer program. Okay. Dan works for Chiron, mm -hmm. but they are like the evil dystopian version of Google. Instead of do no evil, it's like, let's just do all the let's evil. Let's just do all the all evil. All the evil will be done. I mean, just embrace it. Yeah, just so embrace the evil. They're there. They actually have a sort of a virus, a hunter killer virus that okay. is looking for you and hunting uh, as you're in these people's minds. Because these minds are connected digitally to our, to the, in a sort of internet way. Yeah. So they can introduce a virus that at times will be hunting you also, I would say the people that you hack their minds and you're in there, yeah. those people don't want you there. They start to reject you and sort of throw their minds at you in a way, I think. Yeah, it's very much a puzzle. It's very much a maze, a horror maze as you're going through someone's psyche. And yeah. you've got to find your way out. They, they don't want you there. They're trying to push you out. You're going to get confused. You're going to get lost. But somewhere in there is the truth that they are trying desperately to keep from you. Jonathan, this sounds horrific, I have to say, but that's exactly the kind of experience you want from a kind of survival horror game. Otherwise, what's the point? If it's not what's horrific, it's not horror. Exactly. That should be like my new yeah. coat of arms. If it's not horrific, it's not horror. Yeah. Get that on a t-shirt. There you go. Bit of merchandise. You put the terror in terrific. I like that. That's yeah, really you can good. Use that. so, nice. <laughs> Thanks. Well, look, thank you so much for chatting to us. Thank you. It looks horrible, which seems kind of rude to say, seeing as you're up here, but that's kind of coming the point. out Xbox One this summer. Yeah. Uh, can't wait for you to play more. Fantastic. Thanks so much. So earlier today, as is mandated in his contract, Graham got to check out well another racing game, Kel Surprise. Hey, thank you. I am here with Will from the Need for Speed Payback team. How are you, Will? Oh, awesome. Yeah, it's so good to be here in L.A. Absolutely. And it's so exciting to be announcing our game and revealing our game in Hollywood because our game is really uh, Need for Speed seen through a Hollywood lens. We are going to end this starting now. Get me close to him. And I'll take care of the rest. The, the trailer that we've seen here in E3 is absolutely that. It feels like a big blockbuster, massive budget oh, absolutely, action absolutely. movie, right? It's yeah, incredible. that was the inspiration. You know, when, growing up, you know, being a car lover and playing with my Hot Wheels, and you know, just uh, you know, loving you know car shows and car movies, right? And I feel like you know we've amassed this you know, knowledge base of great car chases and stunts and you know scenarios to, to to put in a game that people really want to play, that motivate them to take their hot cars and drive them fast. Absolutely. Do you feel like it's kind of a, a, a 
return to some of what made Need for Speed really special in the first place, that, like, that, that feel of blockbuster driving. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're always looking at what resonates, right? We're always tapped into the community. You know, we, we, we look at our own experience, you know? What, what parts of old Need for Speeds do we want to come back and to put into a cohesive new experience, a modern experience yeah. for new fans on new platforms? Absolutely. And there's so much more to the game than those, those big blockbuster moments, right? You know, when I think about progression, car customization, tuning up your cars, finding new cars in the environment, it feels to me like almost like a racing RPG. You think it's absolutely it's, it, it, it really is a world that you want to uh, throw yourself into and, and immerse yourself and you know I, I think you mentioned RPG you know a lot, a lot of people are playing games where you have this goal and you're not sure that you're going to meet that goal so players have to solve problems they have to make smart choices to pick, oh I'm going to take this car versus that car right strategic decision right there and how am I going to upgrade my car to qualify to, to, to be on par with the rivals in a particular race or mission and once you achieve that you feel great nice. right and then you start that over again Right, so I, I think there's a lot of inspiration from other game genres that just make Need for Speed Payback a, a richer, deeper experience. You know, we've listened to a lot of fans asking for more variety, variety, variety. Right, and so we have you know, all of the core Need for Speed experience. You know, the great intense racing, you know, style events like drifts. Right? Reasons to stunt, reasons to uh, uh, avoid cops, but then we want to to really expand the the palette of motivations, and you know, expanding into a place where you know there's action driving and you know real action movie motivations, like having to deliver this VIP from point A to point B without getting uh, spoiled by the cops. Right? Or there's that secret package that has to get to its destination intact. Like, yeah, all, all those things come together in these heists, right? That's right, yeah. and We saw one in the E3 yeah. trailer, that so gameplay trailer. The trailer, the highway yeah. heist, you know, you've got you know, Tyler who's you know, using his racing skills to carve through traffic you know, along this highway you know, to, to, to deal with rivals who you know, want to protect their cargo and they'll stop at nothing to, to get rid of you and to catch up to this truck that's carrying this $2 million payload that you're going to hijack the truck and, and, and steal. Yeah, it must be a challenge to bring together, you know, really... Um, sort of accurate driving models with that kind of arcadey blockbuster experiences. I mean, how much of a challenge has that been for the team? Yeah, we, we have a really sophisticated engine in Frostbite physics, but you know, something that is sacrosanct to, to Need for Speed is what we call a heroic driving mechanics. Right? That anyone can pick up a controller, pick up the Xbox controller, and they're driving right away. They're driving at speed, they're drifting, they're hitting nitrous, they're getting that you know, sheer adrenaline rush of driving these hot cars at speed. Yeah. And and yet there there's physics in there. Right? There's uh, uh, true physics. There's also different ways of tuning the car. And so if, if it's not perfect the scenario you're in, go in and tune the sliders. Right? Make it suit your style. Make it suit the scenario. You know, Just pick and choose some different upgrades with different uh, pros and cons. Right? All of that is driven by frostbite physics. Right. Okay. And you're bringing a ton of different types of car into the game. Right? Obviously we're going to see the sort of super cars that we're using from Need for Speed. But there's different classes and different cars you can find in the environment as well. Right? That's right, we've got all the type of cars that people expect, right? Whether it's muscle cars, tuner cars, exotics. But we've expanded the palette with something we call uh, derelicts. And this is a culture in America where people are finding these cars in backyards, in garages, like where, in junkyards, and lovingly handcrafting them back from scrap to stock to supercar. Right. right? So if you want to bring that, that derelict back up to mint condition, it's, it's up to you. But then you can uh, build these cars in five different car classes. So you want to take that derelict to race with it? You can do that. If you want to turn it into a drag racer, a drifter, a off-road car, nice. you can do that too. Oh, excellent. So how are you using uh, the power of Project Scorpio to bring some extra horsepower oh, to yeah. Need for Speed Payback? I'm glad you asked about that because you know, we, um, in the last week, Need for Speed, you know, it looks amazing in 4K. We just brought that forward in a more visually diverse game. You know, the first time uh, uh, ever in Need for Speed history, we've got a full 24-hour time of day cycle in the most diverse open world in Need for Speed history. And so when you see that in glorious 4K, you see the, the sun rising, you see the sun falling, you see nighttime racing versus daytime racing. And 4K is just absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely. And of course, with EA Access, you'll be able to get behind the wheel first on Xbox, right? That's right. You know, anyone who pre-orders Need for Speed Payback or is a subscriber on EA Access is going to have first track at the game. Excellent. Okay, boys. 
Let's even the odds. Well, Will, thank you so much. I cannot wait thank to you, get Graham. behind the wheel. It's going to be amazing. We're so happy to have you here. All right, thank you. Back to you guys in the studio. Product not yet ready. Well, we've seen a lot of horror games today, just like that one. So maybe it's time for a good laugh. And that's why I invited Jason Schroeder, the game director of the upcoming South Park, The Fractured Butthole, <laughs> to talk about it. And Jason, see what you did there with the title. Yeah, yeah. I've worked out the code. It's, uh, it's a dramatic sort of superhero story. <laughs> the fractured but whole, <laughs> separate but together. Right, yeah. Has anyone else figured out the uh, joke in the title there? I'm not okay. totally picking I'll, up. I'll, I'll tell oh, you afterwards. Okay. Yeah, I'll reveal it to you. Right, <laughs> let, let's talk about the creative process for the game. What's it like working with Matt and Trey? Uh, it's great. I mean, they're creative visionaries. They're funny as hell. Uh, so just like when we get started on any part of the script, it was always, what could it be? And very, uh, seems like, how are we going to tie all this stuff together? Sort of like genius. And then uh, all of a sudden you get these moments of crystal clear, Oh my god, that's so smart, that's going to be so funny, right. and then let's make players do this. And so they're always looking for those edges and those extra jokes, and it's just, it uh, inspires a lot of us to just be terrible people, but in like a good way. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Have you had a chance just to hang out with them? Yeah, yeah, a bit. I mean, you wouldn't you, I feel like we came to like our combat largely because of uh, playing board games at Trey's house. Right. Like just, like he plays board games, like, super hardcore into board games right now. And for us, when we started looking at the combat system and what should we do, we should kind of mimic what we're doing here with board games, like, because it's fun to think about where to move and have these larger teams and stuff like that. Uh, and so it honestly affected the game. All right, so what, what changes have you made to those combat mechanics then? So last time it was turn-based, like, JRPG yeah. combat, and this time, we took that turn-based stuff and that worked great for comedy, gave people time to deliver their lines. Yeah. Uh, but we wanted to still like get people to feel more seamless, like they didn't really ever leave the environment that they were just exploring. And so that meant adding movement. And so once you're moving and you're turn-based, you're making a tactics game. But we still wanted to make something that someone that's just a South Park fan and doesn't like games necessarily to feel like they could just jump in and so it's really menu light it's not like very you know big camera high level tactics view yeah there uh, they are you can see it on screen now <laughs> you people are playing it here at e3 right what's the yeah. reaction been like and what's getting the biggest laugh um so what we're showing at e3 we have 10 pods out on the floor and people are playing the very first night of the game they're playing they're infiltrating the Peppermint Hippo, which is the local strip club in town, right? Uh, on the in the search of a missing cat, they, okay. someone there at the hippo probably has some information, and so you and your friend Captain Diabetes, who has the power of diabetes, right. uh, infiltrate and you you get some information out of a couple of gentlemen through okay. uh, interpreting dance. Can I can sense your choosing your words carefully here, it's, which is it's, a good thing. It's not safe for work. <laughs> fantastic. When will we all be able to get our hands on the game then? October 17th. All right, fantastic. Jason, thank you so much for your thank time. You. Cheers for coming on Xbox Absolutely. Daily. All right, thank you, Jason. We look forward to the fractured butthole. And now we've made it all the way to the end of our look at your fan favorite E3 trailers. So here is our final entry. Enjoy it.
revenge. Your hero. We're organizing for a revolution in America. We? <laughs> Freedom away from the American people, you're playing with fire. From classic controllers to classic games, we're getting extra nostalgic at this E3, and that's why we're so dang excited for Sonic Mania. And here to take us back to the land of coins and hedgehogs and the blue blur himself, we've got Aaron Rubber, community manager for Sonic Mania. Aaron, first off, welcome. Thank you. Secondly, let's talk about last 20 years we've seen Sonic go into the 3D realm. That's right. Why are we coming back to 2D? Well, we'll get to that, but first, oh. let, let me just correct one thing. It's let's not hear. hedgehogs and coins, it's hedgehogs and rings, golden rings. Just gonna throw you that heard out it there. Here first, that, guys. That was that's a red plumber that gets the coins. Different character. Just want to just want to get that. Who needs them? Nobody. Good. Okay. Well, I didn't say that. You said that. I mean, that, that happens. Um, and, anyway, so um, the reason we're going back to 2D yeah. with Sonic Mania is because Sonic has evolved quite a bit over the last 26 years. Mm -hmm. uh, June 23rd this year, latest month, this is 26th birthday, which is crazy to wow. think about if you're you know like me and you grew up with Sonic, right? He can rent a car now. He can legally rent a car without penalty. Woo, that's the biggest thing in life, right? <laughs> so Sonic games evolved a lot, but for, for 2D Sonic, we felt that we wanted to kind of go back to what it was that really made Sonic so special back in the 90s. That's what Sonic Mania is. Yeah. It's the celebration of the best of 2D, and we've added in so much new stuff to it. So it's not just a rehash. This isn't us just going back and saying we're going to put some old levels in a game. We're making brand new content, and the cool thing is we're doing it with an indie development group. So it's the first time Sega's ever gone out and said, we're going to work with indies and give them access to our flagship property, to Sonic, right? Yeah. And, and give them the keys and say, go. And we'll only minimally like interact with you and tell you what to do. Man, a developer's dream, no doubt. All right, tell me about some of the new stages. Absolutely. So the new stages start with Studiopolis, which is a Hollywood-inspired sort of like film yeah, area. Mm -hmm. There's also Mirage Saloon, which is a desert-inspired level. Mm -hmm. um, lots of cool stuff going on there. And then when I, when I say new stages, we're yeah. also talking about the classic stages. So okay. Green Hill Zone, right? Everyone yep. remembers Green Hill Zone. Yep. It's coming back. You, you play through Act 1 of Green Hill Zone, but when you get to the end of Act 1, you get to this new mini-boss. You're like, wait, this wasn't, this wasn't in the first Sonic game. And from there on in, all of Act 2 is completely new. It's a brand new level. Every classic level, Green Hill Zone, Chemical Plant, Flying Battery, all these old classics the fans know and love, it's going to be brand new when they get to Act 2, and every bit of the experience from there on in is totally, totally updated. Hey, so this is a harken back, of course, to the classic yeah. Blue but tell me, there is a collector's edition, isn't that correct? There is. And what do we get in it? Okay, this is super cool, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to gush a second because we're, <laughs> we spent like eight months working on this. Yeah. Um, it comes with a, a big statue. Like, normally you think collector's edition, like, oh, the statue's yeah. like this big when you actually get it. No, it's, it's a nice size statue. It's Sonic on an old, like, replica Genesis base. Oh. Uh, it comes with a fake cartridge, and when you pull the, the cartridge part down, it's got a gold ring inside of it, right? And then it comes with a little metal collector's card, and it comes with this huge, awesome box. And, and we got the nicest box we could because why not at that point, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, that is a collector's edition that I absolutely would want on my shelf. And that's right? not yeah. hard to see, for sure. Um, so let's talk about, I guess, what we're going to see in terms of when it's coming out, how much does it cost, collector's edition, Sonic Mania, whole nine yards. You got it. So the collector's edition, uh, $69.99. But the actual game, uh, Embrace here, I'm the actual on. game is, is going to be yours for the low, low price of $299. I'm just kidding. Well, it's going to be it's going to be $19.99. Oh my god! And we're super stoked for that price because when when you're getting a full size classic Sonic game yeah. for only $19.99, you're like, wait a minute, that's that's really cheap. You know, it's kind of like an impulse buy. But then you get the game and you go, this is a big game, and and it's a great experience. And that that for us is kind of the key thing. Um, and the date it's coming out is going to be August 15th. So we're right also around very, the it's corner. like two months away. So we're stoked for that as well. Dude, Aaron, thank you so much for being here. August 15th, 18th. Uh, August 15th. 15th, I had it right. That's right. Excellent. Coming out Xbox, yeah. Well, Aaron, thanks so much. Appreciate Thank you. it. And uh, let's send it over to MK on the floor. Hi, I'm MK from the Mixer team, and I'm here with two of our partner streamers, Magnetron and Galadon. Hi, guys. So, Magnetron, this is your first E3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, flying over from Scotland, first E3, first time in America, and uh, having a really good time. That's awesome. So, Galadon, tell us a little bit about what you love about Mixer. 
Mixer has been an amazing experience because just the community is really tight knit and um, here to develop with the community as a streamer, getting into console and PC gaming, not just mobile gaming, which has historically been my focus. So it's been exciting to experience new games with a new community. Well, it's awesome to have you on board. Now, what's one of your favorite features of Mixer that you incorporate into your stream? Uh, I gotta say it's FTL, uh, so fast and light, uh, low latency streaming. Uh, enables us as streamers to engage with the community uh, that's unparalleled and uh, it really makes uh, the whole platform really community focused, being able to have real time conversations with people. Uh, so I absolutely love it. So Galadon, what are some of the games that you like to stream on your channel? Mostly I've been historically, like I said, mobile gaming. So Supercell games, Clash of Clans, Clash Royale, it's a brand new Supercell game called Brawl Stars. Uh, what I've been focused on. But now being here with Mixer and especially being here at E3, the excitement of all these new console PC games really has me ready to dive into a lot of new games. I know, it was so exciting getting to see the briefing and everything. Okay, so favorite moment from E3 so far? Uh, that's easy for me. Uh, I'm very much into... Uh, Battlegrounds, player unknown yeah. Battlegrounds. Yeah, so when that dropped at the uh, Xbox conference, uh, I just, I lost myself. So, super excited, I can't wait. <laughs> Mind blown. How about you, Galadon? It had to have been the double kill on the pirate ship playing Sea of Thieves this morning, live streaming. Came up behind him, killed two guys on the cannons. It was epic. It was amazing. Speaking of Sea of Thieves, have you guys gotten to shoot yourselves out of cannons yet? Absolutely. All the time, it's my go-to tactic. I was 100% sold on that game the moment I found out that you could get shot from a cannon. It's my favorite thing. You know, it seems like a gimmick, but it's actually very functional. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We will be back tomorrow with a ton of other Mixer hosts to play Life is Strange, Forza, and a whole lot more. So let's send things back to the stage. That's us. Woo! Hey! Hey, hey, hey guys. <laughs> it took us by surprise there. But I think we've covered it up pretty well. No one knows. So we mentioned at the top of the show that those of you watching on Mixer would be eligible for some free goodies. And if you're getting an Xbox One X and you want to pair it with a 4K TV, have we got a giveaway for you each day of E3 at 645 Eastern. That's 345 for you cats on the West Coast. We're giving away two Samsung QLED TVs. They're 4K and they are gorgeous. One to someone in the Mixer chat and one at home, or actually one right here. So you at home, one right here. I think I figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> I think you got it, Larry. Wow. But to be eligible to win, you have to remember, you need to be logged in with your Mixer account and linked your Microsoft account to your Mixer account. It's not that difficult. And you must be watching the Mixer slash Xbox stream. All right, and today's winner is over here. Come and get your 4K TV. Yay! Where are you? Hey! Hey! I've got my game show microphone. I don't know who's winning. Yay! Congratulations! Well done, sir. Well done. Now you have to pick it up and carry it out of the show floor. Yeah, you're on your own there, buddy. <laughs> well done, mate. Well done. That thing is huge. Look at that. Well, a big what, thank you name? so much. Rodney. Rodney, where Rodney. are you from? Florida, Rodney. Jacksonville. Rodney from Jacksonville, Florida. You just won yourself this beautiful Samsung QLD TV, 55 inches. I'll tell you right now. The only bad thing is it does not fit into the overhead compartment. You're on your overhead. You're on your own there, buddy. I think your mic is 55 inches as there well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a final oh, close up on Larry's special mic? <laughs> there we go. Well, guys, with that, thank you so much for watching our E3 Day 3 coverage. It's been a joy from start to finish. We gamed, we laughed, we hung out with Phil Spencer. And now I've got to try and steal that Porsche from Forza right off the show floor. So cover for me, guys. Okay, okay sure. it won't take yep. long. Yep. All right, no yep. problem. But first, tomorrow we are live from 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, through to 4 p.m. Pacific time on Mixer only. Well, we'll introduce you to a whole new horde of hosts and Xbox insiders that will bring in you live demos, more giveaways, and of course, a whole lot of gaming. Well, that's it. Time to put the microphone away. We'll see you tomorrow for day four. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Daily live at E3. It's day two of our yes. epic E3 coverage. The show floor is open and it's flooded with industry insiders, media, and fans! Hold on a minute. Larry
Harry's been put in the corner on the floor. My God, it's crazy out here. Hey guys, how you doing? I'm good. Two amazing sleds, 4K curb glass, yeah. hydraulic sleds, showing off ultra high definition thanks to the power of the Xbox One X. It's a monster. Pick one. You I, have to I, pick one. I, I, I can't. You have to. You have to. Pressure. I can't, pick, I can't pick amongst the children. You know how that ends. I will say the one bummer about permadeath is being torn in half looks fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so Billy is like an old school, original, like supernatural assassin badass. That's the, the nature of her. Billy's out to kill some people. Especially on, uh, you know, on Xbox One X. Um, you know, two hours after we got the dev kit, it was running at 4K 60 FPS. That thing's very powerful. And they brought us an exclusive announcement trailer. So gaming for everyone at its root is all about making Xbox a place where everyone Everyone feels welcome and has fun. When you make that jump to 4K, it's undeniable. It is not a thing where you need them side by side or anything like that. You can absolutely tell the difference. Now stop showing off. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is my game. As we mentioned at the top of the show that those of you watching on Mixer would be eligible for some free goodies, and we've got one goodie that's kind of a big deal. Each day of E3, one person watching on Mixer is getting a free Samsung QLED 4K TV! Yeah, because we're givers, we're also giving away a Samsung 4K TV to a fan here at E3 right now. And the winner is Caesar Pellerino from New York. Caesar, the beginning. We have so much more for you all week long. Bye. Goodbye, you think you're a hero? We're organizing for a revolution in America. We? <laughs> freedom away from the American people, you're playing with fire.